Hola, muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos. Les agradecemos que nos acompañen el día de hoy. Today we are very happy because it's our last webinar and we have a very special speaker. Like always, we invite you to visit your YouTube site where we find you will find the seminars of the primer ciclo de seminarios de absorción, edición especials, and of course the lector of the this second eh, the second ciclo de seminarios de absorción. Like I said, today we have a very speaker, Dr. Matias Toms, with the topic Recent Advance in the Textural and Surface Characterization of Nanoporous Materials. Before the talk, we will share with you a resume of Dr. Matias Toms. Go ahead, Aileen. Thank you. Professor Dr. Matias Toms has received his doctorate in physical chemistry in 1993 at the Technical University of Berlin. From 1992 to 1995, he has a project scientific for microgravity experiment on critical absorption, which was carried out on Eureka mission of the European Space Agency, ESA. From 1996 to 1997, he was a, an ICIN Fellow and Postdoctoral Research Associate at the Institute for Physical Science and Technology at the University of Maryland at College Park, USA. In 1998, he joined Quentacrom as Head of Application Department and Quentacrom German until 2001, followed by the position as a scientific director at the headquarters of the company, Quenta Chrome Corporation, Boyton Beach, USA, until June 2018. Um, Since Julie first is a full profession and chair of the Institute for Separation Science and Technology, Department of Chemical and bioengineering at the Friedrich Alexander University, Erland, Norwalk. Professor Tom has been a visiting professor at the University of Edinburgh, UK since 2012 and currently holds also a guest professor position at Laurenti University, Nazi, France. In addition, he holds leadership position in a number of authoritative bodies in his file, including council member of the International Sciolite uh -huh. Association, chairman of IUPAC International Unit of, for Pure Applied uh, Chemistry, task group, physician of gas with a special reference to Evaluation of surface area and precise distribution, share both shared separation division area to I, American Institute of Chemical Engineering, from 2013 to 2017, convening of the International Stand Organization, working work of surface area and porosity, and principal. Scientific adventure uh, to the new air paid I do funded NISFAC laboratory in, at Maryland. Professor Toms had also been a member of the board of direction of the International Absorption Society, Society from 2007 and 2013. And Council member of the International Messy Structure Materials Association. He also served in the editorial board member of the journal Absorption, Journal Advanced Sports Materials, and Absorption Science Technology. Professor Toms has authored and co authored more than 125 scientific papers, reviews, and book paper, patents, as well as a monograph on the characterization of pearl solid and powders. He has given more than 215 presentations um, 
invite plenary and keynote lecture at prestigious international scientific conference at universities all over the world. In addition, he has been co-sharing various important scientific conferences, for example, CPM workshop series and symposium in the fall of absorption and material characterization. You're welcome, Professor Toms. <laughs> That's so nice. So thank you so much. That is very wonderful for this introduction. Far too much. <laughs> Told you not to read this all. So it's my big pleasure. Thank you for the invitation, Reina, to to the, give a seminar in in this very nice cycle of absorption seminars. And I saw all my nice colleagues already have given seminars here. So I'm very honored to be also do this right now. Okay. And thank you. Uh, yeah. So okay. So uh, I'm. I'm, I'm happy to, to, to tell you a little bit about its option. And I don't know, can you see my screen now or how do we cannot, I have to, to, to share, right? The screen. No, go ahead, please. Go ahead. Oh, you see it. Oh, you see everything you see. Okay, wonderful. Okay, that is wonderful. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so actually first, as you have seen, I was spending most of my life in America. And then I decided that it would be good to go back to academia. And then finally, after some other offers, I ended up in Erlangen. And where is Erlangen? <laughs> so Erlangen is uh, here. Here is Munich. So everybody knows Munich. And here's Frankfurt, where in Germany we have the biggest airport. And uh, so, yeah. And uh, so Nuremberg and Erlangen is just in between. Okay. And uh, so you can easily fly to Frankfurt. You reach us in two hours can go to München, it's even only one hour and, and 20 minutes away. The University of Erlangen is a, you know, it's a traditional German university. We have all type of study courses here from medicine to chemistry. We have more than 40,000 students and a quite big technical faculty, which also harbors the uh, chemical engineering department and where I'm now, you know, heading an institute for separation science and technology. So what I don't want to do today is I want to give you an overview about advances in the textual and surface characterization, nanoporous particularly the textual characterization, and then some new, very new things about surface chemistry. Uh, sorry, yeah? Dr. Don, Sherry, your presentation. Oh, I have to share the presentation. Okay, so um, I cannot, so let me see, Bildschirm freigeben. Okay, let me see, Bildschirm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we see it. All right, so you see now the picture here of Erlangen, Nuremberg, and Munich. You didn't see it before, Frankfurt. So we're here in Bavaria. Here you see where we are in Germany in the south. Okay, so I will give you an overview. So what I will do is, it, I, I, I understand I have for 50 minutes or something like that, 55 minutes. So I will give, sometimes I will just go very fast over certain things, but I want to mention them because there were key developments in the textual characterization of porous materials happening in the last 20 years, but I will not spend too much time on it. But then I will go right into way to describe some slides more, more detailed and others I will just very quickly go over them. And at the end, if you have questions, we can go always forth and back, okay? So um, first thing is what I want to say, which I always say, this is a slide which I show since many years, that I want to really say, Despite the fact that I'm a really big fan of absorption, uh, there are many other techniques which you need to consider if you want to characterize a novel material. Okay, and uh, so this is in addition to absorption, and we talk about liquid intrusion, Berkey for symmetry, also scattering techniques, spectroscopy, microscopy, and so forth. Now, what is the the particular thing on absorption, intrusion, and also thermopolarimetry? These three techniques, which I grouped over here, they all have one thing in common. They essentially utilize the effect of confinement uh, on the phase behavior or the behavior of fluids in pores in order to obtain information about the structure of the material. If you're looking at, at gas absorption and you imagine a mesoporous material with 2 to 550 nanometer pore size, we know that you can see capillary condensation in there. And capillary condensation is a phase transition of a fluid which can absorb essentially on the walls and make a wetting film, okay? So as it shifted, so because of the confinement, the phase transition shifts compared to the bulk vapor liquid phase transition, but you know, it's, it's happening at pressure smaller than the saturation pressure at a given temperature. 
If you're looking at murky for symmetry or liquid intrusion of a non betting fluid, you have the same phenomena. We have the phase transition of a vapor to liquid, but now happening at pressures larger than the saturation pressure. And when you're looking at the effect of confinement on not the vapor liquid transition, but on the liquid solid transition on melting and freezing, then we're in the technique of thermoporometry. And also here, you know, there's a shift of this transition based on the level of confinement, meaning, you know, the smaller the pore size, the more, the more is the wetting, the more is the melting transition shifted to lower temperatures. So with mercury posimetry and the understanding of the mechanism behind the phase behavior of non wetting fluids and pores, we have made a lot of progress in the last 20 years as well. I have not the time today to talk about this too much, but I want to show one slide to understand these phenomena altogether. So essentially, when you're looking at meso- and macropore analysis, you have a real analogy between mercury intrusion and extrusion compared to pore condensation and evaporation. So here would be the capillary condensation of a wetting adsorbate like nitrogen, you know, in an ordered mesoporous silica, like KRT6 silica, and you see the capillary condensation and hysteresis happens at a pressure smaller than the saturation pressure. But if you now look at, at mercury, then when you take the mercury essentially intrusion curve, where you watch how the, you apply hydraulic pressure to force mercury into pores, and if you convert that with some thermodynamics into an isotherm, which is possible, then you see here, this is an isotherm obtained from a mercury intrusion extrusion curve by applying thermodynamics. So you see, this is the, the same like the phase transition of, of nitrogen is a capillary condensation of a non wetting fluid. And you see that essentially here, we have a, something like, you know, an inverse symmetry of that. So here's the phase transition of a non wetting fluid happening at pressures larger than the saturation pressure, okay? Also with hysteresis. So in a phase diagram, it looks like this. So if you have here the bulk phase diagram, you have here two pores with pore sizes H1, H2, and H2 has a smaller pore size than H2. H2, H1 has smaller process than H2. Then in case of, of a wetting adsorbate, where the gas absorption area, you see that the phase transition, you cut this line, then you see the capillary condensation in smaller pore. Then when you go up here, you have the phase transition in the larger pore, and that is the saturation pressure at the given temperature of the bulk. And if you have a non-wetting fluid, contrary to here where the bulk phase is a vapor, you start here with a bulk phase to be a liquid. In the middle of the pore, you have the vapor. And then you increase the pressure, and then essentially at a certain pressure, you see then at a pressure larger than the saturation pressure, the phase transition, okay? And you can measure these things. Here's an experiment from my PhD student, Jacob Cerner. We looked into this behavior, not only for liquid metals like, like uh, uh, mercury, but also looking at, at intrusion of water in, on non wetting surfaces. And here is a fully hydrophobized mesopore silica is a pore size 9.1 nanometer. And we developed a novel, essentially, um, intrusion technique to, to measure this kind of phase sphere of water in these pores. And here's the argon adsorption experiment, okay? And here you see the water adsorption, no adsorption of water at all, zero. But then when we go to pressures large in saturation pressure, we see the pore filling of water here as well. So just to give you an idea that these phenomena are wetting, and non-wetting fluids and the effect of confinement belong essentially together. And this is why I also want to talk a little about surface chemistry characterization and I stimulate this essentially with this over, overarching thermodynamic picture. Now, coming back to the textual characterization, you know, you see here that the, the, the very nice thing about applying gas adsorption and mercury intrusion is when combining these two methods, you can cover the whole range of pores going from, you know, below, uh, five angstroms, actually in the order of two, three angstroms, up to essentially, you know, um, in a millimeter range, even by combining gas adsorption and mercury intrusion and extrusion. Okay. So, and this is the big advantage of these two methods, particularly when it comes to characterize more disordered system or disordered fluids, um, to disordered porous materials. You know, if you have ordered porous materials, then of course you can apply spectroscopy. And, and a lot of the scattering methods. But you see all these other methods have a certain, you know, particular sweet spot application range, okay? So the, the advantage of these two techniques by combining them, you get a whole, you know, assessment of a very wide range of, of, of meso and macropores. Now, 
essentially, so I just mentioned we have a major progress in physical absorption in the last 20 years, particularly due to the fact that we much better understand the absorption and phase behavior of the fluids in the pores. Same is true with understanding the intrusion techniques. We understand much better how phase behavior of non-wetting fluids also works. But there's still major challenges which we're going to tackle. The one is assessment of surface chemistry is one of them. We will get to this in a little, little while. And then, of course, you know, many applications are running in the liquid phase, like chromatography, where you have, you know, high pressure liquid chromatography, you have a, a stationary phase material, and uh, which you very often functionalize with, 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 with long chain alkanes, for instance, with certain groups. And you have a mobile phase, which might appear still a lot of work is needed you know, to, a, to arrive here at a very solid description and a solid methodology. So, what we know. What we can do with physical absorption characterization is, of course, a surface area analysis. This is, of course, for everybody important, pore size and volume distribution. We learned a lot about this in the last 10 to 15 years, but also we can, as I mentioned, obtain some information about the structure of the pore network, the pore geometry, but here we have still challenges and surface properties, still a very challenging you know, area. Let me now make some comments about the surface area analysis, the BT area determination. And I will not talk about the problems we having by assessing microporosity, okay? We all know that, that if you have a microporous material, you cannot apply the BT theory because the mechanisms underlying the BT theory have nothing to do with the micropore filling process. So we all know that for, if you apply the BT theory on a microporous material, you only can obtain an, an apparent surface area a BT area. Now we look into want to look into something else today, and uh, so the first everybody you know most likely everybody who listens to the seminar or has dealt with absorption has heard about this uh, BT theory from 1938 and the BT equation, which allows us to obtain in the classical range of relative pressures 0.5 to 0.3. This is you know we call this the the uh, a monolayer you know uh, capacity, and from there you can calculate essentially the surface area. One problem which people very often overlook is that when you take nitrogen, which is a, you know, considered for many years a standard adsorptive, we're looking at a molecule, okay? And the orientation of the molecule in the surface does depend heavily on the surface chemistry. If you have a carbon material, you know, it is known that the nitrogen would like to lay on the surface, okay? and um, as you see here in the slide, and then in order to maximize the, the contact, to minimize the free energy, right? Because it really likes to have maximum contact with the surface. And this is the cross section area, which we usually assume to be around 16.2 angstrom square, which you find in all standards, you find in, in the pre, you know, in the software as so a pre installed value and so forth. But if you add surface, you know, polarity to the surface, like uh, or H groups or carboxyls and so forth, then nitrogen not necessarily wants to stand, you know, because then it is from a thermodynamic point of view, uh, you know, some better to to not lie on this on the surface, but to stand, as I show here. So have like a, a certain inclination to the surface, um, and uh, then the cross section area is of course completely different than what you assume when it lies on the surface. So if it if standing like this leads to an effective cross section area of 13.5 angstrom square compared to 16.2, which is a 25% deviation. Now, if you do not know the surface chemistry, if the surface is full of hydroxide groups, then it will really stand like this, okay? And we know the cross-section area as well. But if you don't know the surface chemistry, the effective cross-section area of nitrogen can be everywhere between, you know, 16.2 for lying on the surface and 13.5 standing on the surface. So, but we don't know. So therefore you have, when you do nitrogen absorption, you want to get the surface area, you have a huge uncertainty just coming from the fact that you really don't know the orientation of the molecule on the surface. And that we recently validated. So we knew that already for many decades, but we couldn't really prove it until like the last 15 years. Therefore in the UPAC recommendations, we recommend to use argon instead, you know, because argon absorption 87 Kelvin, we don't have to deal with the orientation anymore because the more this is just an atom, it's always the same orientation on the surface, independent of surface chemistry. But then recently we started to work with Gudrun Reichenauer from the University of Würzburg and this at ZAE in Würzburg, 
is a German city just one hour away from Erlangen. And by applying small angle X-ray scattering and combining it with gas absorption, one could really prove that indeed the argon surface area is much more accurate for essentially, you know, hydroxylated or a surface, a surface which actually has some kind of polar surface functionality. So we did this by when you do small angle scattering, you do not need to make any assumption about the cross-sectional area. It's not an absorption method, right? So you do not have this kind of, you know, ambiguity. And you see here the problem it is a series of non-porous silicas which we took. So there is no micropores or mesopores in place. And um, so you see, you know, the mesoporosity comes essentially here from the interparticle voids because they were small, tiny, tiny particles, but intrinsically they are not mesoporous. And you see here the data from nitrogen and here from argon, and you see here this huge difference, which I just mentioned, like, like you have a 98 uh, meter square for the for the CPG control pore class with the argon you have when you take the 16.2 angstrom square, the classical cross-section area is something like 25% higher. And you see, this is systematically. And then we, when you analyze the small length X-ray scattering data, they agree essentially very well with the argon data. So this is the specific surface area from, from the small length scattering, and that is essentially from the argon data, and you see there's a perfect correlation of this. So this actually reconfirmed that indeed we can get benchmark surface areas you know, using argon absorption because we have not to deal with this type of ambiguity concerning the, the orientation of the molecule on the surface or the probe molecule or probe atom on the surface. No? So, but now you having now such benchmark data allows us to also maybe develop a new methodology for looking into assessing the surface area of a material which is immersed in the liquid phase. Okay, so now going towards these kind of applications, one of them maybe, uh, you know, characterizing stationary phase materials directly under operation conditions in um, for chromatographic applications. The method we're using here is called NMR relaxometry. Okay, and it works like this. And the, the technique has been used in the petroleum industry since more than 20 years, but never had been rigorously validated with regard to its potential to accurately and reliably determine essentially texture properties of, of porous materials or non-porous materials alike. So we at the moment, just at this two or three slides to give you an idea, we only, I give you some results on surface air assessment, but you also can use it to determine surface chemistry and also, um, you know, pore size information as well. So this is my PhD student, Carola Schlumberger, who just finishes her PhD now and will defend her thesis in a few months. And uh, so what, what is done here is you have a small sample tube which uh, with, the, with the sample and you put this in a magnetic field, a very weak magnetic field of, of roughly 30 megahertz, not 30 to 20 megahertz. And you apply this magnetic field only for a very short time period. Then you switch the magnetic field off and then you see when you're looking at proton NMR, how essentially the protons go back to the original position, how they relax back to their original state. And the time, the relaxation time it takes depends on essentially how many molecules are absorbed on the surface. Okay, so it depends on the intrinsic density profile of the absorbed phase. So here is, is a relaxation profile for pure water. And here you see it for, uh, for a large surface area, which has a even larger surface area than here in the red case. Okay, so you can essentially, by, by developing this methodology based on the relaxation times, and a quantitative analysis of it, you can get information about the surface area of material in, in the liquid phase, okay? And uh, so, and the, the way these kind of protons can relax is either due to the spin lattice or spin-spin, you know, relaxation. You can use both, you know, relaxation modes to obtain this information, but the, the, the T2, the spin-spin the, the relaxation time is much faster than the T1, the spin lattice relaxation time, and therefore, it's very often used to calculate the surface area. And here you see some examples that go very fast over this. This already published just a few months ago in, in Langmuir. Uh, so here is this a series of silica materials. Again, non-porous silica materials. The surface area is, this is one of the new things. In the past, people didn't have benchmark data. They, they didn't know the surface area accurately for these materials because they used nitrogen, didn't know the cross-section area. So we have the benchmark surface areas from argon. 
as proven, you know, and, and, and as I've proven before, that these are the true surface areas here. And then you see here a comparison of the data obtained from argon and from the NMR relaxation, and you see a very good agreement. And you see here again that the silica with 80 nanometers, which is the smallest particle size as the highest surface area, how fast these relax. So essentially you can calculate the surface area not in the in the minutes compared to like a longer time that you need for an absorption experiment. Okay. So we also we also tested this on carbon materials, and also here we got good agreement. So same story. So this should only this should only give you an idea what kind of new methodologies one can develop in order to you know characterize porous materials, maybe not only in the gas phase or in the vacuum, starting in the vacuum or in the gas phase, but also under completely different conditions where, which are relevant for, for certain applications in a, in, a, in a liquid phase. Now, recently we also, and I also just want to mention this, we were able to expand this methodology with NMR reluxometry to determine even more the wetting characteristics of those liquids on the surface, as pore size distribution, but also the we can use it as a, as a tool to assess window sizes, you know, in micropores uh, systems like MOFs or uh, zeolites or carbon materials, okay, like carbon molecular sieves. So this is what we're working on right now. The potential to essentially, you know, look at pore window accessibility, pore window sizes is already published in this paper in Langmuir, which we, you know, which I, which I cited, you know, okay, this is already published. Here on the, on the slide, it says under review, but the slide is, is, is a little older than the publication, so it's already published. Should, let, look it up at Langmuir. This information is all already given you know, in, in, the, in the literature. So there's a huge potential, essentially, one has here uh, still to untap, but more work is still needed to arrive here at an at a even more advanced methodology. So now I want to spend some, some words on looking at pore size characterization by, by physical absorption. And as I mentioned before, I will do this in a, in a quite a fast way. I will mention some major, major developments, but will not necessarily discuss them in much detail, but other you know, more recent and more recent things we are working on, I will spend a little bit more time on. So the first thing which is important for if you want to get the textual information about a material. So this is the decision you have to make. The question is, what do you want to learn? Okay, do you want to get surface chemistry information from absorption methodology, or do you want to get you know, pore structure or pore size? If, you, if the answer is you want to get pore structure information, then you need to choose a probe, atom or molecule, which has the potential to present, to give an isotherm, which can be considered a fingerprint of the material, okay? So this means, however, that this molecule should not have specific interactions with, you know, the, the surface chemistry of the material. And again, if this is what you want, nitrogen is not a good choice because of its quadrupole pole moment, which leads exactly, you know, as we discussed before, you know, to these different types of orientations on the surface. That was the main reason you know, why we had here, we looked at the BET analysis, we had here this kind of problem with the you know, orientation because the specific quadrupole interaction would make the nitrogen lie on the surface or stand on the surface, particularly when it's polar, it will more not lying, it would be more tilted or standing on the surface. But the same quadrupole interaction would also have increased that absorption potential and therefore have an effect on the position or the pressure where pores will fill. It makes it very difficult to get a reliable pore size characterization if you're not put forward a huge effort to get a force field model for a specific material for which you also would need to know then where the polar groups are sitting or the ions and so forth. So the recommendation here is similar like for the surface area to go, for instance, with a natrium like argon. That is a very good probe to go for that. So let's stick with this. And then it has been shown before that you really can get fingerprint isotherms, like you see here for a series of zeolites. You know, when you when you when you go back, you see when you when you have absorption on a series of zeolites, uh, when you plot them all in the linear scale, they all look type one. And the only difference is the uptakes here, which are you know representing different porosities, 
uh, so different pore volumes. But if you plot them in the semi-log scale, you see, of course, they fill at very, very low pressure to the molecular part of vacuum. But you see how now you see in the structure of the isotherm, the, you know, the visibility, you, visibi you visualize the structure of the porous material. Like here for the modern knife, you see here the filling of side pockets below five angstroms. Then you see here the filling of main pore channels at 6.5 angstroms. So by actually a fingerprint of the structure, like for season five, you see uh, the filling of pores in order of five angstroms. So you see right away, without even that you apply any theory, the cause of the crystallographic data, which are available for such zero lights, that yes, you can resolve pore size differences in the one angstrom level by, by argon absorption, particularly because it's not sensitive to surface chemistry. And of course, you can then analyze these data and get these results when you apply advanced approaches like uh, based on statistical mechanics, like non-local density functional theory or you know molecular simulation. Yeah. So when you see this here, just one example of applying this kind of advanced methodology, see here the bimodal distribution of the modernite, and you see in the middle of these two, because in the middle of this step is the filling of the 5.2 angstrom season five pores, you see the peak for the season five. So this is essentially the state of the art, no? to apply argon adsorption and couple it with methods based on statistical mechanics. And the advantage is that you can obtain compared to the classical macroscopic methods, which all assume that the fluid in the pores or the adsorbate state has the same properties like a bulk fluid, which however is not possible because you confine this kind of liquid-like state in the pores to very small dimensions. And then of course, thermodynamic state, but also the thermophysical properties must deviate from the bulk. And this is not being taken into account in all these classical methods here, but if it is taken into account here in, in, the, in, in these modern microscopic methods based on density function theory or molecular simulation. Of course, you can correct empirically for these deficiencies which have been done, for instance, for mesopore analysis by you know, uh, Krug and Sayari, but also in very nice work from our friends from Argentina, from Karim Park, Daisy Barrera and, and Johnny Villarroja, they did uh, some corrections also for you know, making these macroscopic methods applicable over a certain range to get reliable pore size information. But still they cannot obtain the whole pore size distribution over the whole range of pores from micro to meso to macro pores. This only can be done by applying these you know, methods based on statistical physics. And uh, they also allow, this is also state of the art, not only to obtain the pore size from the equilibrium transition, in this case, if you have a mesopore, we have hysteresis, and the reason for the hysteresis is, you know, that we have here nucleation barriers associated with the condensation of vapor, pure capillary condensation in these pores. So this is a metastable absorption branch. This, this is a delayed the condensation and this kind of, you know, metastability, you know, extremely long lived, as you know, hundreds of years. So in this case, for such an ordered system, the desorption branch reflects the equilibrium transition. Right? So you can calculate from the equilibrium transition the pore size by such methods like non-local density functional theory. But meanwhile, you can also quantitatively predict this kind of metastability for a given pore you know, um, shape and for a given material as a function of pore size. So you can quantitatively analyze this. And uh, if you do not have any other contributions to hysteresis then pore networking effects, which would affect the desorption branch, you should get perfect agreement between the pore size distributions now calculated from adsorption by applying a DFT method, taking into account, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> taking into account the delay in condensation and, and uh, quantitatively and the equilibrium transition. So this is also one of the major achievements of this applying of developing these modern microscopic methods. But then you see also here like the classical approach, the Kevin equation based approach, you know, fails terribly to predict the right pore size. No? So this was applied on the desorption branch as it should be, equilibrium transition. And, but you see here is the result from the DFT, which is actually the true pore size as you can validate by using other, you know, means of pore size analysis based on scattering, based even on XID, based on, transmission electronic microscopy, see that 
the you have a huge deviation in the order of 20 to 30 percent essentially you miss the true process distribution altogether you have actually no overlap between the one calculated by the Kelvin equation this BGH approach with the DFT base so it, we can now essentially analyze this data in very very in advanced way and because we can take into account essentially this phenomena contributing to hysteresis. And we can get a process distribution over the whole range. Okay, and there are classical examples. Now, this is a hierarchical structure zeolite, the structure uh, mesopause, this is in five zeolite. And you see here, you know, this is the isotherm, and you see here the bimodal process distribution. Here's the peak of 5.2 angstroms, and here's the mesoporosity. So to analyze such materials, the only way really to do this is by coupling argon adsorption, 87 Kelvin, with then the functional theory or molecular simulation. The same is true for carbon materials, you know, micro-mesoporous, hierarchical structured carbons, which are used in supercapacity applications. So also here, the only way to do this is by, by applying this kind of advanced, you know, methods based on statistical mechanics. And then, of course, another a, a big progress was taking into account surface heterogeneity. This led to different approaches. You know, you can also you can you take this heterogeneity to account also in two-dimensional DFT pro, uh, methods, which were put forward by my friend and former co-worker Josh Yagiello, but also by something we developed with Alex Nanmark's group. Um, you know, and Peter Novikovic at that time, 2008. Um, quench solid density functional theory taking into account heterogeneity. Uh, very, very important that when you when, when you have a usually theoretical models always assume that you have a smooth surface, and when you have a smooth surface, you get something which a UPAC had predicted like a type six isotherm. You see two dimensional phase transition, layering transition, layer by layer. So each layer, which itself forms, you know, one after each other. And this is what the theory would predict if you don't take into account heterogeneity. So this is semi-log scale of an isotherm, you know, for carbon material. And you see here this layering transition. But the experiment doesn't show that because you have heterogeneous surface. And if you don't take this into account, you get these famous, you know, minima in the pore size distribution. But, you know, this is, of course, an artifact. If you take into account heterogeneity, like here for Crank solid density the functional theory, you get a perfect pit to it fit to the experimental isotherm, and you get a more realistic process distribution. So this is also one of these advances in the last 10 to 15 years in process characterization. So when, however, you go beyond just looking at the you know, pore sizes, then you also would like to see how these pores are connected. Okay, And also here, there was a lot of progress in the last 20 years, which are based on an understanding of this hysteresis behavior. And you see when you look at the UPA classification of isotherms, and you have here this type 4A isotherm, from the type 4 isotherm, you can spin off essentially six other isotherms which have different hysteresis loops. No? And these hysteresis loops essentially are a combination. So the reason for this hysteresis is, of course, thermodynamics, this delay of condensation. So you always would have a chance to see hysteresis if you have even single pores if you had certain temperature and pore size ranges, but also you could have, you know, very interesting effects of the pore network, um, like pore blocking or cavitation. And you see here an example for a percolation transition happening, affecting the evaporation. Like this is a typical irregular pores material. You would condense first in the next, then you go to the larger pores here. So you fill pores according to the size. But then you would also expect a large pore to empty first, but it can't because these, you know, liquid in these pores is blocked by the liquid here. So essentially, you have to wait until you open this neck, reaching a pressure associated with that, and then everything goes out at once. So it's a typical pore blocking phenomena, and you have a very steep step down here, which essentially now is associated only with the characteristic entrance size. You could have the pore blocking phenomena also. In a different way, if the pores are not connected like this, but quasi independent, but having now a very um, uh, similar cavity size by the variation in the next size, but empty independently from each other. So each pore would empty quasi independently by pore blocking from each other. Then you see also it is essentially the inverse shape of the hysteresis here, H2B. And th in this case, the desorption branch reflects the size distribution of next 
Well, this is the distribution of essentially the pore cavities and the necks together. Okay, so so potentially here is filling all these necks, and he filled here the cavities. But here's the distribution of necks. When the pore neck, when the entrance here to the ink bottle pore, in this example, oversimplified example, is smaller than the critical size, then you see a phenomenon called cavitation. This means that this essentially this cavity can empty before we even empty essentially the neck. Okay, and uh, so this very fascinating is essentially um, you you um, you you explain this nowadays by the following that you know before before I actually show that slide you know before we even knew that the pore size the neck size it would be decisive for that um, you know but could do an experiment where it goes out. Of course, the liquid here is still stretched, but if the neck size is very small, then the pressure needed to empty the neck is smaller than the pressure associated with the spinodal, the liquid vapor spinodal, and that is the limit of stability. And then when therefore you reach this spinodal fall, the pressure associated with spinodal is reached before you reach the pressure, which is much lower to empty the neck, and then you see cavitation. All right, so this is how we can explain these phenomena. But of course, it's important to take these things into account when you characterize force materials, because if you have cavitation, this means that this step down cannot be associated with any information about the next size. But here you could, and the next size is very important to know for many practical applications. All right. So here's a classical examples where you know I could see the cavitation as how to study cavitation in model materials, and that is also. Uh, you know, cavitation. This is an isotone type you find very often in, in many examples. And uh, um, so very often this comes from, you know, this, this step down comes from evaporation of much larger pores, which are in the interparticle framework of the porous systems, or they come from intrinsic mesopores, which are only accessible to pores in a micropore range. And uh, very often people make the mistake that they, that they think that this Pore size calculated from this step down would have any real meaning, you know, that for pores in a certain range, but it doesn't. It's an artifact, you know. So this peak here doesn't belong here. So this peak here, this step down is actually evaporation from liquid from much larger pores, okay, somewhere here. And so therefore, one has to be very careful by analyzing such type of isotherms. And uh, this is an artifact coming from these cavitations, uh, which leads to this kind of classical step down in the range from 0.5 to 0.4. Now we have a, a, now a, a really huge toolbox of methods available to differentiate between these different contributions, essentially to hysteresis. No? Okay, and, and I would like to keep this a little short now, also in the interest of time, because I would like to refer to, so I will jump over the slides, as I said, the first is to compare, you know, to analyze these data with using different models from the density functional three, some of them take into account the delay in condensation for the absorption and others the equilibrium transition. And then you would sense different thermodynamics by using you know, different fluids like argon and nitrogen absorption and so forth. And we would, I would like to refer you to that tutorial review, which just was published two years ago which I, you know, go together with my PhD student, Carola Schlumberger, whose picture you have seen already before. So I just want to highlight the potential of, you know, using scanning of hysteresis loops as a, as a, put, as a way of obtaining information about poor network connectivity. And this is what you see here. So the idea is when you have a poor network and um, you have, you know, like this ink bottle pores, so if you condense in these pores and everything is completely filled, if you now evaporate, you will essentially see this pore blocking effect. As we have seen, you empty the pore network only then when you can empty the, this kind of one of these pores, empty the next, and then everything will go out, this percolation transition, okay? But if you now study this experiment again, so you do the experiment like this is the boundary curve, and you go then, up to a certain pressure only and fill this kind of network only to a certain percentage. And then essentially you go back here in, in a, a, before filling the whole network, then there's a good chance that essentially you will not see this pore blocking effects at all. And the isotherm 
has now a completely different shape. So the thoresis group is now more reflecting like a something like a type H1 isotherm. Uh, so this type H1 thoresis indicates like here that you have essentially removed all the restrictions. Now, this kind of idea to sense the poor network like that was pioneered already in the 50s by De Boer and Douglas Everett. You know, we, I give this seminar now to Mexico. I really would like to mention my dear friend, uh, Fernando Rojas, and uh, his uh, um, uh, former advisor, Magiota, um, and then also, you know, and Fernando Rojas from, from, from Mexico, uh, he essentially pioneered such networks models for, for many decades and pioneered them really in the, in, the, in the 90s and 2000s. And he was the last postdoc uh, of Douglas Everett, I believe. Okay, so therefore these are like the grandfathers of this thing, but the Mexico have a huge, you know, experience how to analyze these data. So this is one way of doing this, and there's still a lot of work to be done, and we are working on this. I don't want to go into, we can see here from the shape of the scanning curves, you learn something about the underlying contributions to hysteresis, and then you can make conclusions about the poor network. For instance, if you have no restrictions, then the scanning curves look the same like this boundary curve. If you have percolation, the scanning curves end up here in this way in the lower closure point, and if you have cavitation, they go right into the desorption branch. So also, you know, some similar than you have for unrestricted pores, because if you have cavitation, all the pores empty essentially independently of that what happens in neighboring pores. So that could be the basis of a new kind of network model, which we're developing right now. This is my PhD student, Jacob Serna, and uh, we have a manuscript in preparation, which we contributes all these, takes all these contributions to hysteresis, put it all together and allows now to get information, you know, in a in a more accurate way than it was possible before because of poor necks, cavities, poor connectivity, and, and some other effects as well. That are key descriptions of networks as well. So I will skip over this is an example which is a which we featured in in this kind of um, paper with my colleague Harvey Garcia Martinez. Um, I will skip over this right now because we have not so much time because I want to talk a little bit about uh, also the surface chemistry assessment. But this is already described very nicely here in that review article from 2017 and also in the this tutorial review as well. So with this, you get a full assessment of this type of uh, poor network characterization. A little bit with scanning, but not too much in all the scanning yet. But as I said, this is work further in progress. Um, so to summarize a little bit about the textual characterization. So I gave you a very fast overview about you know, the physical absorption and also mentioned mercury for symmetry of powerful tools. I po pointed to the fact that we need really good, you know, you saw very nice absorption isotherms. We need really high resolution data, but we need to couple them with methods based on statistical mechanics, molecular simulation or methods based on mean field density function theory. And this gives us some, you know, detailed information on pore size, but also the potential to get for network information. But we still need to couple these methods with, and this is for the future, you know, with scattering techniques, um, in situ scattering techniques, and also with spectroscopy, which particularly is interesting to apply when we want to look, you know, also at the characterization, not only in the, in the, in the vacuum or gas phase, but also you know, in the liquid phase, so looking at the characterization of functionalized post materials in the wet in the wet state. So, let us now go to in the last few minutes of the of my seminar. I think I have maybe five to, to seven minutes left to to give some ideas about the challenges in assessing the surface chemistry. So here is you know very often water is being used to do this to do this because water is very sensitive to the surface chemistry but also sensitive to the to the pore texture as well so therefore it's a, not a good molecule to use by itself alone for any characterization so you always need to couple it like for instance we couple and many others do the water absorption with absorption of a fluid where we know that you always have a wetting adsorbate, right? So like argon adsorption at the boiling temperature or even nitrogen adsorption at the boiling temperature, but nitrogen is not very good for the sensing surface chemistry and also not for pore texture because of specific interaction. So say with argon makes a fully wetting adsorbate phase and we compare that 
with the absorption behavior of a fluid which is sensitive to surface chemistry. And you see here, as I indicated also before, if you have fully hydrophobic surface, water will not absorb. And you can only get it into pores like this silica light, which is a zeolite with five angstroms and uh, pores. You can only get it into this when you go to pressures larger than the saturation pressure. I showed you a slide like this in the beginning of my talk. But if you change the surface chemistry and make it more polar, you see the transition to you know, a typical, you know, more type one or type two isotherm here from an isotherm which doesn't absorb water to really a change in the low pressure so pressure range um, of the absorption isotherm shape due to more you know, attractive interactions now. And then when you look at carbons, this is also interesting. These are hydrophobic materials. Here is the nitrogen absorption isotherm, absorption and desorption, completely reversible, and nitrogen would make your wetting, you know, absorbate. But water will first not go into this pores, but then forms on some heterogeneity, some polar sites, clusters. And these clusters can essentially at some point, you know, they're big enough that from neighboring walls, they can coalesce and they can fill the pores. So this is a, not a capillary condensation, but it's a coming from this clustering phenomena, which also has, you know, metastabilities associated with it. Therefore, we have a hysteresis here and the desorption branch is the same mechanism here than the have for nitrogen in this micropoise, like it's just a you know, molecular evaporation, like it is also here when we dissolve. So with different mechanisms, you get this interesting hysteresis with water, despite the fact that the pores are so small that you see not capillary condensation. But the, the problem here is that this surface is very heterogeneous. So in order to learn something about the correlation between you know, the surface chemistry and the water absorption, and then vice versa, be able to extract from water absorption information about surface chemistry, it needs materials which have essentially well-defined surface chemistry. And in the past, we have worked with periodic mesoprosogano silicas where you can have in the pore walls of a silica certain organic groups, okay? So you don't functionize the surface and you put organic groups in the pore walls and depending on the size of the group, you can tune the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity. And here was an example where for the first time, you know, this was a material made by my colleague Michael Fröber in Hamburg, we were able to make it two PMOs with benzene groups in the pore walls and divinyl benzene in the pore walls, same pore size, right? And by different surface chemistry, you see here the pore size distribution from the argon isotherms are here, you know, identical. But then you see that the water absorption isotherms have completely different shapes, indicating directly the effect of surface chemistry on this. So I'm not going to detail to describe this now, but this is all being described here in this paper. So we see here the effect of surface chemistry on the whistle crystal basis, but also here in the lower pressure range, you see here that the benzene PMO is more hydrophilic than the divinyl benzene PMO, which looks very, very similar to that we saw seen here for, the, for this type of carbon material. So very hydrophobic. So this means that when we're looking at the phase behavior now, that if you have a, a given material with a given pore size, like we have here, right, that when um, we have complete wetting, the, the pore condensation happens further away, or we have more, you know, hydrophilic, more hydrophilic surface chemistry, we see uh, that the pore, that capillary condensation happens further away from the bulk vapor pressure line. That's essentially here what you see here, right? That when the pore, when the surface gets more hydrophobic, the pore condensation evaporation, the pore filling shifts closer to the saturation pressure. And that is reflected here. In the case of non wetting, this would be like local dissymmetry. We see the phase transition happening here at pressures larger than the saturation pressure for given pores. So, but still, we wanted to look more in more, more detail into an understanding of how details of the surface chemistry would affect the water absorption, and then use this to develop a methodology to obtain from the combination of water absorption and spectroscopy reliable information about the surface chemistry of materials. And we started, therefore, again, with a silica type of material. And the idea was that we take SBF 15, and together with my colleague Martin Hartmann, here from the University of Erlangen, uh, who is a, you know, so an expert in the synthesis of materials, we functionalize this, this surface, surfaces of the SP15 with methyl groups in a very, very defined way so that we, you know, depending on the content of the methyl groups, we tune the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity 
very, very accurately. So we know for these different samples, we have different degrees of, of methyl groups on the surface, and this would give rise to different well-defined differences in hydrophobicity uh, or hydrophilicity as you wish. And this was then the, the positions of these groups and the amount of the groups was studied by uh, in solid state NMR. Okay, not going into detail. And then we did the characterization for the textual characterization. We applied again the principle to say that we want to have a probe which is non-specific to surface chemistry like argon adsorption. And we did that. And my postdoc, uh, Carlos Cotrado Colados, actually I saw when we started to talk, I saw a picture of Joaquim Silvestre Albero as also one of the speakers of the seminar series. He was um, Silvestre Albero of Shimo, as we, as we know him. Uh, was a PhD advisor of Carlos. So the world is very small. So I had Carlos to come to Erlang two years ago. He does wonderful work here. So we characterize these materials with different surface groups of the surface methylation uh, degree. And we found that when we got more methyl groups on the surface, that indeed the pore size shifts slightly to smaller values. And this was good because it indicated that we really had these methyl groups on the surface and changing slightly the pore size, but only a little bit. So we could, for our purposes, assume that here for all these materials, the pore size essentially didn't change and you only changed the surface chemistry, similar like we had here with these kind of PMO materials. <clears throat> so this was very good, but also we knew that here we had, you know, the metal groups on the surface that we had a, a small, you know, change in the pore size because of that. Then we also want to point, I want to point in the last two or three slides to a very important phenomena, when, which more, many people do not really know. So, although it's quite well known, when you have a, you know, in the, in the literature, but it's not that very often, you know, discussed. When you have a surface which has some hydroxide groups, which is not fully hydroxylated, okay, and then you essentially start to run water absorption on this. This is what we did now on these samples, okay? So this is the starting with the pure SPA 15. Then you see very often that the isotherm is open. And the reason is not an artifact in the experiment, but the reason is why you're doing the water absorption, you rehydroxylate the surface, okay? And when the surface is rehydroxylated, it's like this process of rehydroxylation is a chemisorption, so therefore the isotherm stays open. When you do the second run, so after that you do a second experiment right after that, so subsequently, subsequently, and then you see that the isotherm now closes because after the first run, sometimes you need three runs, but after here, in this case, after the first run, you had almost managed to have a complete, essentially, hydroxylation of the surface. And then the second experiment, you only see the physics option and now a closed, a closed surface. Depending on how you make the material, that can be, you know, you can have fine situations where this is the way you do not have any rehydroxylation to start with at all. Like here for material which you obtain from a, you know, a company who is expert in making chromatographic materials. He, here we had both runs right on top of each other, so no retroxylation. So this needs to be taken into account. So everything we did then was based on the on this on the material which was now uh, aged essentially with water in the sense that we have a fully hydroxylated surface. So then we we proved that not going to detail with again with with NMR spectroscopy and we could really prove that the retroxylation happened in this first cycle. Right? And then we went, and I go very fast now, then we went ahead and developed a methodology to determine now um, the, you know, the content from these isotherms after the second cycle from the water absorption data, knowing the pore size accurately from the DFT analysis, uh, we are able, and also for course, we could calculate the Kelvin equation, we could calculate now from essentially these positions of the these option for here, because you have no pore block in this case, the effective content then you know, of the, of the water inside the pores, okay? And then for the materials which do not see any water absorption, these are the ones which have a high degree of methyl groups here. So we don't see any water absorption going in this. See, we're going up to the saturation pressure of one, nothing happens. And so we developed this intrusion technique. So we treated water by just changing the methodology of Murphy for symmetry in a while. If you have questions, I can answer how we do this accurately. And I saw this picture already before, we were able to obtain these intrusion curves. And knowing the pore size, we can also now, so here's now the complete picture on such a material. So SP15 with 100% methylation, fully, full, fully 
carpet surface is fully covered with methyl groups, the argon adsorption is still beautiful, you know, uh, H1 hysteresis, capillary colonization, no water adsorption, but then we can measure this water intrusion. And from this extrusion experiment here, this is the direct experiment to hydraulic pressure, we apply a thermodynamics to obtain essentially the vapor pressure because, you know, so we convert this intrusion curves into an isotherm. And this is essentially done here. So this is a water absorption isotherm of a non-working fluid in this system uh, obtained from this intrusion data. And now we can calculate the contact angle of this non, you know, wetting water phase, which is, you know, by doing, by, by knowing the pore size from the argon data, we can now, by using the Washburn equation or the Laplace equation, calculate the effective power. And this leads then to the fact that we can obtain now for the first time the contact angles of water inside the pores over the whole range from, from, from wetting, okay, to partial wetting to non-wetting by combining these methods, essentially, you know, we can obtain these contact angles uh, depending on exactly on the degree of methylation. And you see this here, this is a contact angle inside the pores. And we have, I've developed many years ago another methodology to assess surface chemistry by defining hydrophilicity index. This is described in this paper. I do not want to essentially go into detail here. Here the method is based on comparing the water absorption as, a, as, a, as, a, what, as an isotherm where the water as a probe is sensitive to surface chemistry, but we compare it with argon absorption, which always wets the surface completely. So by this comparison plot met, comparison method, similar like you know, philosophically like a T method, we can determine hydrophilicity index and we see that when the surface is completely hydrophilic, then the hydrophilicity index is one and the contact angle should be close to zero. And you see this correlates wonderfully. So for the pristine SPF 15, which we had fully, you know, in this case, hydroxylated, the surface is completely hydrophilic. Here, the contact angle we obtain is close to zero. The hydrophilicity index is one. Then we increase essentially the hydrophobicity, right? And we see that when we increase the hydrophobicity, the pore colonization of water shifts to slightly higher values, right? So shifts as we discussed here, and this was the phase diagram, I think. So we shift essentially, so it's increasing, you know, hydrophobicity, we shift essentially closer to the saturation pressure. Not this is what you see here. So here we see the, the complete hydrophilic, complete wetting, then here the partial wetting situation. And then in order to see the phase transition for the non-wetting fluid, we have to go at pressures above the saturation pressure. So this will be for the fully hydrophobic, and then essentially apply this, you know, intrusion techniques to determine. It, you know? So now we can we can really obtain, therefore, you know, a complete analogy here between the hydrophilicity index and the contact index. So this 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 these kind of you know assessment is completely consistent, as you see. No? So these are the fully when you have a fully hydrophobized system, then hydrophilicity index should be close to zero, and the contact angle is larger than ninety degrees. So, so pre pretty nice, I have to say. We submitted this meanwhile, and this this work is under review right now. Then, in addition, we used uh, my, we collaborated with my, my colleague Anna Smith here in, in, in Erlangen, and she calculated now, and this is the first time that this was possible because the surface chemistry was so well known, and we tailored the surface chemistry so accurately, she could essentially mimic this quantitatively in a molecular dynamic simulation. And you see here, this is the density profile of water on the surface. And here for the pristine silica, you see that we have you know, you know, these kind of absorption peaks, you know, these oscillatory density profiles and here by click with like density, but for fully hydrophobized surface, you see that the density of water close to the pore walls is, you know, depleted and then only approaches the by click with density further away from the more, from the wall when you're more in the core of the pore again. So really good, you know, confirmation of that what we found here by analyzing this water absorption and intrusion data, which only is possible because we knew so much about the details of the system based on the spectroscopy by NMR, which we did before. So this brings me to the summary. I apologize that I took a little bit more minutes than I was supposed to, 
So I think we have now, when I summarize the work here on the surface chemistry set, this is all pretty new work. We have developed here a comprehensive strategy to assess surface chemistry of nanopores materials by combining different methods. This is the key here. You cannot do it by one method, by advancing adsorption, novel liquid intrusion technique, and solid state NMR. And having said that, we also uh, now developed a tool based on MR reluxometry. And the paper with NMR, NMR reluxometry allows us to get essentially the contact angles, you know, directly from the NMR reluxometry assessment. And this paper is now being impressed. Okay. And so this is something which, which we, we added to this as well. We're able now, the, the point was that we, with this SP15 material, we could really, we know the pore size here is a well-known structure and we could therefore tune the surface chemistry in such a defined way that we are able now to correlate practically every portion, every, every part of an isotherm with either the effect of confinement or a surface chemistry. And, and because we could make materials where the pore size was essentially not changing much or not at all, we could correlate essentially here this absorption behavior entirely with surface chemistry, which allowed us then to quantitatively analyze this and get contact angles of, you know, of the fluid inside inside the pores, which is essentially quite unique. And I believe that also the confirmation by molecular dynamics puts some more, more insights you know, into this methodology. And we hope we can apply it to other systems as well and get for the first time really reliable information about surface chemistry. This brings me to the end. Would like to thank, uh, of course, here, my, my co-workers here at my institute but also funding agencies like the German Science Foundation who funded some of this work in two uh, research centers, and then also the German DOE, the Federal Ministry for Economy, Affairs and Energy. And we'd like to thank you all for your attention. And again, apologies for, for taking a little bit more time for my, for my webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation, Professor Downs. Very interesting. And uh, now I will read the chat question. Let me see. I have someone. Yeah. Alfredo Jimenez. To study the porosite distribution, which method is recommended for you? BJH, NLDFT, or QSDFT? So for which material was this? For a carbon or for a... For for which material is a general the process distribution or for a certain material? I didn't understand the, this part of the question. Yeah. So the, the question is whether I like whether BGH is more appropriate, DFT or QSDFT, but it would be good to know for which type of material. So the carbon or so I would say if you in generally the DFT method is the method of choice and gives you the most accurate process distribution. As you also can see here, you know, from this slide, I just tried to scroll back. Okay, so you see here, all right, that even that for, for a certain process range, roughly up to two nan 20 nanometers, the classical method, such as the BGH method, underestimates the true pore size, you know, significantly. Yeah? So you see here the true pore size, which you can obtain for this SB15 uh, by various methods, independent of absorption, electronic microscopy, XID, even scattering techniques, you know, is essentially, you know, very good in agreement as it has been shown in the literature with the pore size distribution from non-local density function theory. But the Kelvin equation completely underestimates the surface, the pore size. So, Therefore, you know, the DFT method is the recommended choice for the pore size analysis, even more because it allows you to obtain the pore size distribution of the whole range of micro-mesal pores with one methodology. For instance, in this example, you could not obtain with a classical method like the BGH uh, and another method for micropore analysis from the classical, you know, method spectrum, you couldn't obtain the true process distribution because to assess the micropores, you would need to take, you know, a method like the Howard Carroll's cytofoldy method, and then for the mesopore analysis, you would need to take as a classical method the BGH, but then you have to stitch them together, and at the end, 
you know, you still would have a deviation. So with the DFT method, you can obtain the whole process distribution over the whole range. This is the other advantage. Now, <coughs> sorry, if you have, um, have a, a heterogeneous surface, like a carbon, so a microporous material, which is as heterogeneous as carbon, then essentially, you know, you would like to take this heterogeneity into account. And for carbon materials, the QSDFT method is the recommended method to take, okay? Because the quench solid density function theory takes into account the heterogeneity of the surface. And while DFT doesn't do this, and it would predict here this kind of layering transitions, okay? So that is not a problem for many zeolites because zeolites are essentially very, very highly ordered. Surfaces can be crystalline, and we do not see this layering transitions happening essentially, you know, for, for so, you know, for the, for the zeolite. Uh, we see a very pronounced pore filling step. As you see here, when we look at the zeolite, see, when we have a zeolite, there's a very well-defined pore, you know, structure. We see well, well-developed steps here. And so, therefore, any type of effect of, you know, a, a smooth surface on the, um, on the theoretical isotherm is not as problematic as it is here for a carbon, where you have, you know, a very, so we have a very wide distribution of pores. We have not a really true signature in the absorption isotherm. And therefore, uh, the theoretical assumption of a layering transition, assuming a smooth surface, leads to this kind of mismatch between the experimental isotherm and the theoretical isotherm obtained by applying the DFT method. So that is um, not a problem for micropore silica, so zeolites, also not for moss, okay? It's a problem for the carbons. And therefore here, we, take into, we have to take into account explicitly these type of heterogeneity, and this can be done in the quaint solid density function theory approach. I hope this answers the question. Thank you. And um, Sandy Lopez, if the isotherm of my material doesn't match with any of the isotherm published in the YIUP paper, mm -hmm. how do I categorize it? Okay, so very often with these experimental isotherms, you have a you have a, you know a, a mix of contributions. Uh, from different pore sizes. You might have micropores, you have mesopores and macropores. So the, your isotherm, the way you characterize it, you know, it's a combination of different types. So you would say that, for instance, let me see uh, here, right? That is a, a, this is a, this, this material has micropores, as we find out here by the pore size analysis. You see this is micropores with over nanometer and mesopores. So this is isotherm I would characterize as a combination or between type one and type four, uh, because type four would be mesopores only, type one micropores, so it's a combination of type one and type four isotherm, which is eight, with an H2 hysteresis group, okay? As an example, okay? So here you would have the same, that, that is now the, the isotherm in a semi-log scale, in, in, a, in a logarithmic, in a linear scale, it would go like this, it would have a slope here. So it's also an isotherm, which is a combination of a type one and type four isotherm. Let me see if another example, right? So these are just, as I said, you know, these are type one isotherms only, right? And and here you would have combinations. Let me see my it goes not so fast as I wanted. This is pure mesopause. This is only type four. This is a combination between type one and type four. And then you have a story of, so as I said, H2. So it's a combination of all this, okay? And then here you have, um, yeah, that is that is essentially, because we cannot say from the semi-log plot so well. Let me see if I have another example to demonstrate this. Okay, so this is a purely mesophorous system. All right, so this is a this is also an interesting case. So this material has, you see, this has micropores, but also mesopores. And, a type H2A hysteresis. So this is, a, again, I would say when I would classify, it's a, a combination of type one, type four, with a, with a type H2A hysteresis. Okay, do you understand the concept? I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, Edna, 
Is it correct to calculate the surface area and pore size of a material just with the absorption isotherm when it is not possible to obtain the complete one? Complete one? So I did not completely understand. Can you read this again? So is it possible to obtain the surface and pore size if I from an isotherm which doesn't is not measured up to the saturation pressure? Is that correct? Or yes, can, can maybe. You... I'm not sure what, what you mean. Maybe the analysis is not finished. Yeah, so okay. So you can get the surface area if you have enough data uh, in the pressure range up to 0.3 relative pressure. Okay, so if you have enough data in the relative pressure range up to 0.3, you can calculate the surface area, okay? But you cannot calculate the pore size distribution if you have not the complete isotope. Yeah. And um, how many points at low pressure are necessary for a good analysis in microporous materials? Okay, so this is a good question. So essentially what you need is, so my recommendation is to do the following, okay? So you, it's, it, 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 this is not a, a, an, a, an answer depends, the answer depends on the type of material. You should do the following, like here, you should essentially, you know, plot the data in a semi-log scale, okay? So when you measure these isotherms, plot it in semi-log scale and you should have enough data to, to have enough resolution that you can see the correct shape of the isotherm. For instance, here, when I plot this in linear scale for this model organic framework, I cannot, you know, there's no way for me to, to oh. see if there's enough data points. But even in a logarithmic scale, I see I have enough data points because I start at zero and I see that the pore filling is in this range. So I know I need data points here. If I would not have a point here or here, I would not have the right slope of the isotherm and would get essentially, I would not be able to calculate a true process distribution. So it depends on the structure of the material. For the modernite, I, if I start the experiment here, I cannot see the pores which are filling at this very low pressures, right? So it depends on the structure. But if you see that if the absorption is above zero, you know you have to go to lower pressures to get the full isotherm. So my recommendation is it depends on the structure of the material. And you should look at the semi-logarithmic scale of your data. And this, uh, this tells you what you need to do to get a sufficiently high resolution. Thank you. And um, what about use argon at 77? Argon Kelvin. at 77. Yes. So argon at 77 Kelvin is a question which very often is, is asked because you have liquid nitrogen readily available. Why not using argon at 77 Kelvin? So the problem is the following. Argon at 77 Kelvin is essentially below the triple point of argon. The triple point of argon is 83 Kelvin. So at 77 Kelvin, you're 6.5 Kelvin below it. This has a lot of implications because now, you know, particularly when you're looking at, if you have mesopause, you know, then we know that the phase diagram, the phase diagram of a fluid is shifted in this mesopause, the critical point is shifted, but also the triple points are shifted. And the, the amount of the triple point shift depends on the pore size, okay, when you're below the triple point. So meaning that when you measure argon at 77 Kelvin, that when your pores are larger than, than roughly 180 angstroms, 80 nanometers, and larger than that, you see in the middle of the pore the formation of a solid. So you see transition from vapor to solid, the sublimation. When the pores are smaller than that, you see a capillary condensation uh, from a vapor to a super cool liquid argon. Okay, so you're still essentially, you know, but all below, although you're below the bulk triple point where the bulk phase becomes a solid, in the pores you have a super cool liquid. Okay, so why you do the measurement is the next complication. Your saturation pressure is therefore, as I mentioned, the solid. So you measure up to a pressure which corresponds to the vapor pressure of solid argon, which is roughly in Mexico, most likely uh, uh, roughly 160, 170 torques. Okay, so the temperature is quite, because your high is quite low in temperature there. So it's lower than 77 Kelvin. So this leads to many problems. First of all, you cannot obtain the full process distribution from an argon 77 Kelvin experiment. Okay, you're limited in the upper pore size range. You can go up to 
roughly how that AT angstroms. Then, you know, you could obtain the the micropore size for the micropore size analysis, it would work. Um, for carbons, the existing DFT kernels, which are available to analyze argon data at 77 Kelvin on carbons to get the process distribution. Okay, so that would be possible. The uh, also, in principle, you could essentially obtain a surface area. But all the assumptions, essentially, which I'm saying, are made on the fact that even though you're below the triple point, you have a super crude liquid argon phase in the pores, which, however, I have to say, has been confirmed. Okay, so it's it's not ideal. You can use it if you if you know if you're only looking at a certain region of your pore size, you know, assessment. Yeah. If you're not if you're not looking at larger mesopores, it might be a valid method to go. Uh, has an advantage. It's 3.5 more sensitive than the absorption of argon at 87 Kelvin because the saturation pressure is lower, right? But altogether, it's less than optimal because you're below the triple point. You you're dealing with uh, not so well known thermodynamic conditions. Uh, also, the cross-sectional area, so we talk about the surface area analysis, the cross-sectional area is not so well defined when you're below the triple point also. So there are some uncertainties here. So my recommendation would be, if at all possible, use argon at the boiling temperature. This gives you the full spectrum of pores. Everything is well defined. And, and, and there's a lot of um, data there to confirm that. There's a lot of analysis tools there. And if you cannot get the liquid uh, argon, uh, it's difficult to get, there are now devices which for not much money allow you to like, it's like a cryo, another cryo cooler. But even when I was still, you know, being scientific director at Quantacom, one of the last things we developed was something called a cryo sink. That is a very relatively inexpensive device which uses liquid nitrogen. You can put it under your sample cell in the station and allows you to measure from 77 Kelvin up to 100, above 100 Kelvin. And you can easily then obtain a temperature which would cause one to 80, 87 Kelvin, the liquid argon temperature. And this device is really not that expensive. And uh, it's maybe a way to use liquid nitrogen to measure at the liquid argon temperature. That would be my, my, my recommendation. Thank you. I think those were all the questions we had in the chat. Um... Thank you very much. And Reina, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your presentation, for the answer. It is a, always a pleasure for me sure. to listen. <laughs> uh, so we will share with you a certificate for today's participation. Let me. Yeah, let me yes. see. Okay. So, all right. Yes. yes. Okay. It is a certificate. Uh, oh, this is nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we will send more later. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, nice. Thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Yeah. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for it's an honor for me uh, <laughs> that you have accepted our invitation. And um, please let me say goodbye this meeting okay. in Spanish. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, Agradecemos a todos nuestros participantes que nos estuvieron acompañando a lo largo de todo este año, que empezamos con una charla del doctor Jean Ruquerol desde Francia. Eh, tuvimos participantes de Uruguay, Argentina, México, Brasil, eh, bueno, México nuevamente, España, Francia. Eh, y finalizamos, wow, pues estamos súper felices que iniciamos con el doctor John Ruquerol, finalizamos con el doctor oh, Matías Toms, creo que son las dos personas que nosotros okay. admiramos y conocemos sus libros y papers y todo, entonces estamos muy, muy emocionados. Les agradecemos mucho a todos los que nos han acompañado a lo largo de estos seminarios, también visualizándolos, tanto en vivo como posteriormente. Eh, y, y yo en especial quiero agradecer mucho a Erendira y Isaac porque fueron las dos personas que han estado acompañándome a lo largo de estos dos ciclos de seminarios. Les agradezco muchísimo y espero que vengan más proyectos más en el futuro. Y sin más, gracias. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Año Nuevo a todos nuestros presentes. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas to everybody. And it was my pleasure. I'm very honored to have a chance actually to talk you know, and, and have a, you know, chance to, to see and my Mexican friends and also very honored to be in the group of invited speakers because they're all dear friends of us and me. 
and uh, so I'm really delighted. And I hope to see you hopefully soon in person again. Everybody also who listen to my talk and uh, uh, have a nice Christmas and, and a good start in the new year. And be healthy. It's the most important thing. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>